2021 board work session for the Lynchburg City School Board. And as we are calling our meeting to order, we do appreciate uh, the participation of the public in tonight's uh, work session. And as you observe all of the information featured on our uh, board docs uh, relative to the meeting tonight, that we are continuously operating under all of our COVID-19 uh, protocols and please govern yourselves accordingly uh, in the audience. Tonight's meeting, of course, is going to be featured live streamed on YouTube and the rebroadcast daily on Comcast channel 17. And so you may uh, feel free to do that. There'll be no public comments tonight, but at our May 4th, 2021 meeting, uh, those comments will be entertained. So we thank you for that. At this time, uh, we will now move to section B of our meeting, which is pertaining to our agenda approval. Once again, board members, this is a prayer, uh, a, a work session tonight, and you see the agenda. Is there a motion to a, approve the agenda for tonight's work session? Move to approve the agenda for tonight's work session. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Seconded by Ms. Morrison. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, Dr. Gupta. Uh, Dr. Coleman, uh, Councilman Hagelson shared an enrollment report with me, and I'm hoping in future work sessions we'll have an opportunity to discuss the enrollment uh, report. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. Would the board clerk please so note that uh, regarding enrollment, and I will speak to a couple other matters before we go into our agenda items under section D for tonight as well for future meetings. All right, thank you. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries. We'll now stand for our Pledge of Allegiance at such a crucial time as this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, individual, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. We'll now move to Section C of our agenda for tonight's school board member reports. I will simply call these uh, items out. If you have a report or information to share with us, please do so. If not, uh, obviously, we will move on. Uh, first, our finance committee, uh, Mr. Gary Harvey. Um, in discussions with members of the Finance Committee and also with um, Ms. Lukonich, um the one item that we had for discussion can be postponed to our next meeting. So the meeting for April has been canceled and we'll um, reconvene uh, next month for the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May that be so noted by our clerk. Governor School Liaison again, Mr. Harvey. Yes. Uh, the. Uh, the Central Virginia Governing School Board, Governor School Board, Governor School Governing Board met on Wednesday, April 14th at 1 p.m. via digital format. Uh, the following items were discussed. Um, a financial report was submitted and reviewed. The 2021-2022 <laughs> budget was presented and reviewed. Uh, the board approved a fund balance access for the, for the school. Um, we looked at the 2021-2022 um, the academic calendar, and that was approved. Uh, we had it for a review at our February meeting. Um, Dr. Smith uh, gave an update on the Commonwealth's legislation related to the governor's schools throughout the state. Um, he also updated the board on um, the selection data from each of the schools that are a part of the Central Virginia Governor School. Um, he also gave us an update on the student results from the science fairs and symposiums. Um, many of those uh, students uh, that are LCS students, we heard about at our last board meeting, so I won't uh, list all of them uh, again. Um, then the board had a closed session, and finally the board had a vote to provide a salary increase to the Central Virginia uh, Governor School Director. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, May 5th at 1 p.m. All right, thank you for that uh, detailed report, uh, Mr. Harvey. We appreciate it. Any questions 
uh, Dr. Gupta. You know, Dr. Smith volunteered that he'll be willing to come to our board and present his diversity plan, how he plans to diversify. Do we have him on the, any future agenda? Uh, Dr. Edwards, I know this has come before the board once before, and I was of the opinion that either between you and Dr. Jordan would find the, the most appropriate time where all of the groups could share. Do you want to speak to that now? Or, or? When, you, when you say all of the groups, are you referring well, to the uh, STEM he, Academy and yes, LS, all of that? We have not worked that out yet, but we okay. certainly can, if okay. that's the will of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards and uh, Dr. Gutta, so, so recorded. Thank you. Any further questions uh, for Mr. Harvey? All right, thank you. Uh, lower Regional Liaison, Dr. Carter. No report at this time. Our next meeting is May. Thank you, Dr. Carter. All right, our STEM Academy Liaison, Dr. Nillis. No report. Thank you, Dr. Nillis. And our Legislative Advocacy and Community Relations uh, Committee, uh, uh, Chair, Ms. Bell Evans. No report. I am going to send an email about a possible date change. For the okay. One. So that will go out tomorrow, but it will be in May. Thank you. And we are planning during the May work session to discuss important matters concerning uh, the uh, LARC uh, committee. And so thank you for that, Ms. Evans. All right. Then that uh, swiftly moved us through Section C. And we will now move into Section D for agenda items. Uh, before I get into that, I do want to remind the board, uh, as you have heard tonight, uh, Dr. Gupta, I believe in two instances, is that we are more than open uh, with our agenda to deal with matters that are pertinent and found necessary by the board. We just have to work them through the proper process. And so uh, we do look forward in the future of uh, talking about block classes or the matters that came before us last time. We will not discuss that tonight, but at some future piece, we'll have that on relative to anything else that we want to, to share. Uh, could be public comments, enrollment, uh, Gulf School or whatever, but those will be future times. Tonight, we want to focus on return to learn updates, the CNI department introduction and interview, uh, overview, I should say, and then student achievement data presentation. So I'm going to turn this portion of our meeting over to Dr. Edwards. Okay, thank you. And just to, before I get started on that, I want to make sure I invite the right folks to um, the work session. And is it just the programs for which the board has a liaison that sits on? So the Gov School, the STEM Academy, and the Laurel Academy, and I'm inviting those directors to come and share. Members of the board, I don't want anybody to not understand what we're saying. We, I'm having trouble hearing. Okay, I'm very sorry. Um, what, what, has, what I was suggesting, that I think Dr. Edwards has led us through a very well thought out process of what goes on work session agendas. The board can funnel to us matters that are of importance. And so we're trying to figure out some of those things, one of which Dr. Gupta is wanting us to hear from Dr. Smith. He and I met with uh, Dr. Smith at some earlier point last year, I believe, can't remember. Mr. Harvey obviously is doing a fine job with that group. And so there had been some previous discussion in the board that if we had one come, maybe we needed to have all of those groups give a brief overview. And Dr. Edwards is trying to find out which of those groups is she inviting to come when we do that? Dr. Smith from the Gov School, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Gupta. And Dr. Smith volunteered that he'd like to come and present his diversity plan to our board. So he himself volunteered for that. Okay. So if we're clear, is anyone else you want to come to share with us along that line? I interpret no one else mentioning that, that it would at least be Dr. Smith, Dr. Edwards, and your wisdom on whomever else might. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, and again, before we get to Return to Learn, although this is part of Return to Learn, uh, yesterday, and you may have seen in the news as well, uh, there was mention that the governor is looking to ease 
the restrictions placed on the performing arts and possibly recommending that the participants uh, be similar to, the, to that of athletics, which is for indoors, the, the fewer of either 30% capacity or 100 um, participants, and then 500 outdoors and 30% capacity. So there was a lot of traction about that in the news yesterday. I know a couple organizations also sent out information. I did participate in my soup call this morning, but I do want everyone to know that although that was somewhat of a preview of what the governor is thinking about doing, we have not received the official guidance that says that has been changed yet in the executive order. And I think that's timely to mention given some of the things that our schools are doing right now in terms of thinking about what we're gonna do for performing arts. But I wanted the board to know that and I do believe WSET might have had a story on it last night as well, that although that's public knowledge that that was discussed, the actual information in the executive order um, change has not been received by school divisions yet. Okay, and with that, we are going to move to our return to learn um, updates, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Pugh for our regular updates. Thank you very much. I see in the agenda there are some dashboards, so do we want to cover those at the end or would we like to cover those first? We usually do them at the end, um, unless you want to go first. I don't Dr. have a preference. Okay, I will go ahead then. Good evening, board. Um, I have just a few updates. Um, as you know, last week we welcomed back our pre-K to uh, second grade students four days a week and that has gone well. I do have some updated numbers as of today. In pre-K to two, about 84% of our students are participating four days a week, and 16% continue to be in the remote only environment. Today, um, some of us got to, again, participate in the excitement as third through fifth graders started their um, journey on attending school four days a week, and that was, again, exciting to see lots of students getting off of the buses and lots of students getting out of their cars, being dropped off by families with, again, we can't see their smiles behind the mask, but we can see the excitement in their eyes um, and the excitement that was uh, throughout the building. The numbers today uh, for third through fifth grade, about 66% are participating in four days a week and about 34% are continuing to participate in remote. So if we look at that pre-K to five overall, um, it's about 78% four days a week and 22% continuing with remote learning. And again, our sixth grade uh, students will be returning on May the 11th, so our middle school staff, while they are in the middle of administration of SOLs in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at all three middle schools, they are continuing to work out the details for the return of those students to sixth grade, six days a week. Um, and that's really all the update that I have, except for I, I do, I believe, doc, uh, Steve Gatsky, uh, Senior Director of Finance and Operations, as well as Angel Garcia are here, Transportation Director, to talk about and address some of the concerns that have been expressed and, and come to light uh, with last, last week's transportation, um, some, some issues. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Is this working? It does. Okay. Um, very happily, the uh, return last week went very well with the schools. Unfortunately, it did not go so well in transportation. Um, it was a, it was chaotic, um, and uh, unfortunately, we had an incident uh, with a couple of students in the elementary, um, where the uh, where the parent was very very upset with us, and rightfully so. We dropped the ball. Um, it was miscommunication. It was wrong uh, information in our system. Uh, the school, fortunately picked up on it and took care of everything on the school end. However, the communication between transportation and the school and the parent became more confused because the information that we were going off of was different than what the school was going off of. And I don't want to get into the particulars um, and the details. I just want to say that, you know, we, we know we dropped the ball. Um, we recognized that. We recognized it at the time. 
um, and we are doing uh, what we can to address it. One of the first things we did was made some changes in responsibilities so that more, some of the responsibilities are more centrally um, located, if you want to put it that way. What I'm saying is we have three dispatchers, all were involved, they're all involved in the same responsibilities. They're all doing routing, they're all working with the drivers, they're all answering the phones and whatever. And we have now taken one of those dispatcher positions and put them strictly in the routing. Um, just working with the uh, computer software and working with the schools and with the administration as far as doing all the routing. So we're trying to um, get it to a point where um, essentially we only have one person that is responsible for what's going on and, and how the routing is done on the buses. Uh, we think that that will uh, streamline things and also um, take care of a lot of the confusion that we have. Some other things that we're looking at um, where the, the, the software we currently use for tracking the buses, and we do have GPS tracking on all our buses. We are not fully using all of it yet. Um, what there, are, there are modules that can be added that will uh, allow a parent to know when the bus is coming down, how far away the, from the stop. It doesn't, tra it doesn't allow a parent to see where the bus is at any particular moment. You don't, we don't want that, that's a security issue. But it will tell a parent that the bus is five minutes away from the stop. And so we're looking into that um, for, um, for the parents to be able to use. It is a, it's a smartphone app. Um, also, along with that, we are looking at actually being able to track the students on the buses. So right now, everything's paper and pencil, uh, basically. We got, you know, paper list of who's on what bus, who's supposed to be on what bus, where they get dropped off, where they get picked up. All of that is just done on paper. There is, a, again, another module for this um, um, the software that we have uh, would allow us to, um, as a student gets on a bus, they could put in a pin, they could have an ID with either RFID, um, you know, swiping, um, a magnetic strip, there's a, a number of ways they can do it. But as a student would get on, they would be accounted for electronically as they get on the bus. So they take an ID and swipe it through just like we uh, the staff does as far as uh, getting in and out of the buildings and whatever. It would then pinpoint that child that that child is on that bus. And then, of course, when they leave, when they get off the bus, they do the same thing, and it shows that, that they have left. Um, and so we are looking at that also. Uh, I think it's time that we uh, s start using some of the technology that's out there. Um, some of this has been around for quite a, quite a while. Um, it is expensive, and in the past that is kind of what has kind of prevented us from doing some of this. Um, but uh, it's, to me, I think it's, it's, uh, it's something we need to look into. We need to use technology to help us do our jobs. Um, I don't know how much more you got. That, 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 thank you, Mr. Gaston. That, that is... Um uh, sufficient. I would uh, like to say that this board takes very seriously matters pertaining to uh, the area in which you speak uh, for efficiency and effectiveness and we're very thankful for Dr. Edwards and her leadership. As we seek to address this going forward, board members may have questions or concerns, but uh, we need to get on top of this and do what we need to do relative to the delivery of that very important part of what we do. Is there any board member that would like to speak uh, to the matter at this time? Dr. Brennan. <clears throat> Mr. Gassi, a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much for dealing with that issue last week and being so thorough to follow up on that and respond to the family. And thank you for taking LCS, taking responsibility for 
things that we didn't do correctly and we're going to do better with. That's a huge step in the right direction. Thank you for that communication to that family and to the public. Um, stepping back a little bit, as far as the overall transportation situation, we were concerned about children coming back to school and number of children on buses. Can you give us a little update as to where we stand with trans transporting children to schools and whether there's been um, a difficulty with the number of students on, a bus, on buses? I'm going to let Ms. Ray answer that. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So as of today, I have not seen, heard, or received any phone calls about having too many kids on the buses. We're seating two kids per, per seat on the buses as a way to, uh, to mitigate any kind of uh, possibility of, uh, of COVID. Uh, we, are, we are enforcing the the mask usage for for the students on the bus so so far we have not reached the capacity we have put a capacity on the buses of 40 kids remember most of our buses are either 65 or 77 passengers capacity we have determined a limit of 40 students on the bus mm -hmm. that's the only way that we could transport the students to school uh, on four days a week. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Um, I just have three things. The first one is I thought two years ago, at least two years ago, we approved uh, a sum of money for a GPS system to use on buses that could be used to trans ch check where kids were. So are we not doing that? I thought it was a huge amount of money if I remember correctly. Does anyone else remember? Yeah. Yes, we do have a GPS system that was that was added uh, a year or so ago. Um, it, it does track. We use it to track the buses and everything. Now we want, and that's as far as we took it at that time. Now what we want to do is take that same software and just use the capability to push it out to the parents, which is an additional cost. It's another module that you have to add to it. Okay, and, thank you. And so along with that, there is a, still another piece where you can track the individual students. With the pen. Right. 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 Thank you. The um, second point is I realize that we transport a lot more students to just to and from school. Um, we do a lot of to school and innovations, to uh, after school programs, to preschool programs. And I think at some point it would be very valuable to this board to understand what exactly all of this entails and the amount of work that we're putting on our drivers uh, and that we're assuming responsibilities for a lot of things and maybe we need to look at those things. Um, my third point is to thank the parents. My husband has been volunteering as a crossing guard this week at one of the schools and he said the number of parents are dropping the students off in the carpool line has been significant, and I think that greatly helps us with our bus transportation. So I just want to give a shout out to the parents who are helping us with our transportation endeavors. Thank you both for what you're doing. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. And of course, for the record, please make sure, um, Mr. Day, that we have all of these things so they can be passed to the superintendent accordingly. Ms. Evans. I was just going to say, I really like the idea of having that GPS pushed out to parents. I think it would be super helpful. I think it could take a lot of parent phone calls that come downtown away if they had the ability to see, you know, the bus will be there in a certain amount of time. I think that could be very beneficial for parents, and I like that idea a lot. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Dr. Carter, that you want to speak, please go right ahead. I just want to thank the way it was handled. And it is scary when you're trying to figure out where your child was, but luckily the child was on the bus. It's just the lack of, or the communication was crossed or they were in the wrong bus and the wrong whatever, but it was resolved and that the child was safe and was safely on a bus. That was great. Um, and yes, and it would be great if we can just use that software to the fullest extent that we paid or that is paid to do and able to do now. And hopefully it'll be easier for us to do and just get that, and then, and also changing one of those positions, just like a triage, to take care of those 
situations and make sure we're all on the same, um, looking at the same child and where they are and everything, that will help with the confusion because the child was on the bus, so that was great. But it doesn't relieve the parents' stress when they're trying to figure out where it is. But great, the way, you, way it was handled was wonderful. Thank, thank you, Dr. Carter. Anyone on this side want to share any concern? All right, so th thank you, first of all, Dr. Edwards, for having them to come in to share this matter, which means that we're not trying to avoid it, we're not trying to, to um, not give it its appropriate attention. I do want to go on record that I certainly am willing, I know our vice chair and, and other board members as well, to work with the superintendent as we go forward to provide whatever is needed, but also to deal with the area of transportation and to make sure that it is all that it needs to be. And I think that it's important that we do that as quickly as possible. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gasky, and thank you, Mr. A, for coming and sharing with us tonight. Thank you. All right, Ms. Pugh, any further matters before us? I do not, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Edwards, the next item. Okay, so we have had, um, at least this year, a tradition of having different departments come and present. Um, and when they do come and present, part of what we do is ask the director to kind of give an overview of what that department does and the people that are in that department in terms of how they are organized with supervisors. Um, we've heard from the communications department, the HR department, um, the special education department. And tonight we have Dr. Jordan who will give an overview of the curriculum and instruction department, which is their name, but they do so much more than just um, curriculum and instruction. And then following the brief overview of uh, how that department's organized and some of the things that they cover, uh, she and Dr. Fowler uh, from Heritage High School will also give a presentation on student achievement. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Jordan and welcome. Dr. Edwards and Dr. Jordan, if you could allow the chair for just a moment, we're gonna get right to that. That was a great intro, but I failed to recognize Dr. Um, Sinha's report relative oh. to the update. And if we could do that first, and then we'll go into that. First, um I want to apologize because our meeting last week, I had prepared a dashboard, but I failed to send it to um, Ms. Day to include in our agenda. So it is part of your packet for today. Um, mostly things are looking pretty good. We were starting to trend upward in weekly cases, but we're trending back downward. Our positivity rate is down. Um, the, if you look at the second page of the 420 handout, um, you'll see what appears to be conflicting information, but uh, the school metrics now are by week and the most recent week uh, available was April 10th, whereas the data for the locality reflect April 20th. Um, but if you look for the locality, you can see that uh, case counts are down, uh, positivity rate is down, outbreaks are fluctuating. Um, but low, um, and the um, number of cases among healthcare workers is down. So on the whole, I'd say it's looking pretty good. Um, and we're up to almost 50% of Lynchburg residents having gotten at least one vaccine shot, which I think is pretty good. Great. Well, thank you, thank you. Dr. Sinha for that. Any questions from any members of the board? All right, we consider that information and thank you for it. Now we'll go to Dr. Jordan. Excuse me. Good evening. I can't see all of your faces, so I'll do my best to make <laughs> eye contact and stay in the microphone, which is going to be a little unique. Um, in a nutshell, curriculum and instruction is what we teach, the curriculum part, and how we teach it, the instruction part. We do a lot more than that in my department, but I'm afraid we would be here all night. 
I want to address the important members of the CNI team. I'm the director. I am going to st say that I'm the new-ish director until I've at least served one calendar year, and then I will stop claiming to be new in this position. Um, I have instructional supervisors who I work very closely with, Dr. Brad Bryant. He oversees career and technical education, um, along with a few other areas like health and PE and fine arts. Sarah Campbell, that name is probably very familiar. Sarah is in a new role as the elementary supervisor. You knew her in her previous role of coordinating summer school, after school programs. Um, Tracy Foster is the newest member of the supervisor team. She is overseeing supporting secondary humanities. Um, Maria Yeager has been with the division for a number of years. She is supporting secondary math and science and gifted. Um, she oversees a lot of the processes in our department. So she works very closely with the governor school, dual enrollment, and a lot of the programs that you all are interested in hearing more about. There are two coordinators. Karen Bucklew oversees assessment. So she is the DDOT, and we are currently SOL testing in the midst of a global pandemic, and we will do the first SOL remote administration in a few weeks. Um, so that part of our department is hopping. Another part of our department that is very, very busy right now is grants, federal programs. Christy Compton is the coordinator of our grants and federal programs. It is grant season, and if you know what that means, we are looking at data, we are talking to departments about needs, we are talking to schools about needs, and we are doing our absolute best to get the information to you as soon as possible. We are waiting for the release of the grant applications from the VDOE. Um, we have one instructional specialist right now. Courtney Bennett is in a new position um, she is the literacy instructional specialist. So some of the data that we're gonna look at in a little while is PALS data. So that is um, particular to um, literacy. We have a vacancy in the department right now. So that's why I have TBA um, for a STEM um, specialist. So that position, we had somebody move from the science specialist to an elementary instructional um, coaching position. So that's a vacancy right now. Support staff, Laurie Meadows, Torian Vaughn, and Misty Fretwell help with finance procedures, coordinate with um, local colleges and universities for student teaching, partnerships, mentoring, um, Torian Vaughn spends most of her time coordinating with private schools. So you may be familiar that a lot of our grant funds are for Lynchburg area private schools. So Torian oversees a great deal of that. Misty Fretwell helps us organize and obtain everything that can be barcoded. So if you don't know what that is, that is any instructional technology, any instructional resources. And she and her team are very, very busy this time of year. Um, I put an asterisk beside folks who are in their current position for less than one calendar year. As I talk to you about curriculum and instruction, as I talk to you about the function of our department, I want you to understand that we are looking at things through new eyes. We are looking at things through 
different department organizational structures. We're looking at curriculum and instruction in the middle of a global pandemic. So everything we are doing right now, we are doing it differently. When I talk to you about the vision for the CNI department, I hope my department supports everyone else. I hope my department makes other people's jobs easier. I hope it clarifies the vision for instruction in the community. I hope that we prioritize what's important for students to learn. I hope we focus on learning more than we focus on teaching. We focus on outcomes. We're visionary. Um, I hope my department helps Lynchburg City Schools be the leader of learning. I used to work somewhere else. I hate to admit that sometimes here, but I'm not a native Lynchburg student. I'm not a native Lynchburg teacher. But in the region, Lynchburg led professional development. Lynchburg led the charge with technology. I interviewed with Susan Morrison a long time ago. We wanted to work at Lynchburg City Schools. I wanted to make my mission, my team's mission to make sure that we are leaders of learning and that we are doing the best we possibly can for our students. And we're not in competition with our local school divisions. We can help each other. I want to work collaboratively with everybody in the region. So as we move forward, I want you to know tonight I'm going to share some data with you. I'm going to share some philosophies. I'm also going to share a piece of my heart. And this is not the only conversation we need to have. Um, and I'm willing to do the hard work. I am willing to look at data with fresh eyes. I'm, I'm willing to answer the hard questions. Uh, and I hope, I hope you are too. I have an outsider. Dr. Kenya Fowler-Parks is here with me. She is not a member of the curriculum and instruction team. She's an assistant principal at Heritage High School. She is the new Dr. Fowler Parks. And her study elicited so many student responses. We would be remiss if we did not bring her to the table for this conversation. I am going to share with you the numbers. I'm going to share with you the quantitative. And if anybody who knows anything about me, that's hilarious. I'm a qualitative girl all the way, but I'm going to share the numbers. I'm going to share the figures. And when I'm done talking about the data sets that we're gonna to discuss tonight, Kenya is going to come up and talk to you about the story, about the surveys. We will share with you findings and next steps and then we will take questions. But like I said, we are open to further conversations about student achievement. I do not want to be here once a year to talk to you about what's already happened. I want you to know along the way. You will see on the screen in front of you a lot of acronyms I want you to think about measurement. I want you to think about how we measure progress in, let's say, healthcare. Think about vital signs. I want you to think about all the different ways that you can measure your physical health. There are so many ways 
to measure student achievement, to measure growth, to measure change. And those words in the word cloud in front of you are just a few ways that we measure things in Lynchburg City Schools. Nationally, NAEP is probably the most recognized measure, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So that's national. Lots of times when you hear about learning loss, people are using nationally normed assessments. State assessments, we rely on standards of learning. We rely on the PALS test, which is the phonological awareness literacy screening. Locally, we rely on <clears throat> SOLs, PALS, IXL diagnostic, classroom assessments, ESGI, VKRP, and all of the other acronyms that teachers use that other people don't understand. We measure students in various ways. When we talk about multiple measures, we oftentimes use the term triangulation. We're trying to see if the SOL and a diagnostic and a classroom assessment shows similar trends. We are trying to see, just as a doctor might, is your blood pressure high? Have you lost weight? What's your respiration? I have a new smartwatch and it freaks me out. It tells me to drink water and it tells me to breathe. So there is something about this that's measuring my health all the time on a daily basis. Our students in school are measured daily. They're measured every class period when you're thinking about the teacher formatively assessing students. We look at SOL tests every year. 2019 is our last complete data set. So the information that I shared with you prior to this meeting was 2019. That seems old. That's the last complete SOL data set that we have. 2020, there were no SOLs. 2021, we are in the midst of the most current SOL administration. It will be different. We will be able to use the data. It will look very differently though. We are having more parent refusals. We are having parents choose remote administration. So it won't be all in-person data that we're used to. We will use it. It will be used to monitor individual student growth and Someone who came before me who was very wise said, no data is data too. If we're missing data on certain students, that's something that we also should measure. So when we're looking at data sets that are not complete right now, we have to worry about students that we won't have an SOL on in 2021 we may not have a diagnostic on them. So as soon as we get students back to us in person, we will need to take their vitals. It's very, very important that we do that, that work so we know what's our baseline, what's our starting point, what's our measure. Long-term, if we're talking short-term and long-term, SOL testing begins in the third grade. So we start measuring students. A lot of these assessments that you see in front of you are kindergarten. Long term, we measure students with AP enrollment. AP testing is 70 years old. That is a historic measure of academic achievement or academic success. We measure enrollment 
in programs such as governor schools, dual enrollment, STEM Academy. We measure things like CTE credentials, workplace readiness, the NACTI, the WISE exams. We measure students from the time they walk through our doors until the time they leave. And so if you think about our mission statement and beyond was added in there. So we are measuring diploma types. We're measuring on-time cohort graduation. We're measuring whether or not students are going straight into employment, college, trade schools. We are measured as a school division through state accreditation. State accreditation has been waived for this year. Federal accreditation has not been. So we are still being measured, even though it will look differently in the middle of a pandemic. I want you to talk with me about a data set from 2019. It is risk ratio data. Have you all seen risk ratios done before? You can answer. Have you seen them? No. In finance, we do calculate risks. Okay. Where else might you see risk ratios? So finance. I took an epidemiology class one time and I thought I was never going to use it. Epidemiology. So the risk of diseases. So when we're looking at risk ratios with academic data, it may be a new way to look at a data set. You have topics or areas like chronic absenteeism, reading SOL failure, writing SOL failure, history SOL failure, math SOL failure, and science SOL failure risk. What were your thoughts when you saw this data set? Again, this is the last SOL administration. Have you seen this data this way? No? No. There's an achievement gap for What's your premise for using a risk ratio? How do you calculate those ratios? We are working with an organization called VTSS, and we work with them, and that's Virginia Tiered Systems of Support. Am I right, Mrs. P? Yes. And they had us look at risk ratios early this year as we were working with them, because we've probably not looked at academic data this way. Um, I can get you information about how it was calculated. I did not calculate it. Because I'd like to know how do you standardize your data? Uh, because you have to have certain benchmarks to be able to do that. Yeah. I will get you the way this was calculated. All of the calculations came from the data sets that are public. So the school quality profiles uh, that are listed and in the link above, that's a public data set. So here, as you're looking at risk ratio, anything that's lower than 1.0 would be a decreased risk. Anything from 1 to 1.9 is a relatively low risk. Anything from 2 to 2.9 is a moderate risk. And anything 3.0 and above is significant. And again, we're looking at division level data. We are looking at a data set that is a couple of years old, but I wanted you to see we absolutely have areas of concern. What happens if a student is in 
more than one of the categories. What if a student is black, students with disabilities, and or economically disadvantaged? They're counted three times. The risk multiplies. Same student. Right, the risk multiplies. So as we look at the data, we have to look at the past. We have to look at where we came from. We can't always dwell in the past, but we have to be committed to moving forward. We have to look at the truth. We have to look at the reality. And we have to make sure that we are intentionally addressing what we know. I want to bring you to a more current data set. This is fall 2020 PALS data. Students in pre-K through three take PALS. K through three is measured um, where we compare cohort to cohort, we have most data on K through three. What were your thoughts? What were your reactions when you saw fall 2020 PALS data? For the most part, they're in line with the state data, which was good. What does PALS stand for? PALS is the Phonological Awareness Literacy Screening Assessment. So it is measuring foundational literacy skills. If students are below the benchmark in PALS, they are at a significant risk of failing an SOL when they get to the third grade. So when you look at Lynchburg City Schools, we are higher as far as students who are below the benchmark. We are higher than the state average everywhere but third grade. So when you look at it at the division level, there are many things to look at. We've got quite a few students who took this assessment remotely. So this is, was as we were transitioning to in-person learning. One thing I want to highlight, I'm gonna move on to the next bit of information. I wanted you to see the PALS data for a number of reasons. PALS, we have quite a few years. So if we want to follow longitudinal data, historical data, we can follow PALS assessments in Lynchburg City Schools. We can also see the state averages. There's a lot of data surrounding PALS. This is a significant data set when you're looking at anywhere between 86% of students and 91% of students were assessed using the fall PALS, even if students were assessed remotely. We have quite a bit of demographic data for the fall PALS. So for students who were identified to be below the benchmark in, on the PALS assessment. Majority at every level are male. We have anywhere between 56 to 62% black or African American. Black or African-American and white, 
we have anywhere between 7% and 9%. And PALS also reports out on ethnicity, so Hispanic and not Hispanic. wanted to share with you, and these are taken directly from Dr. Edwards's presentation that was done for you and for City Council. If you look at current demographics, 7,572 students, we're at around 59% economically disadvantaged. Lynchburg City Schools has 49.3% black st student enrollment, 31.8% white student enrollment, 9.6% two or more races. So a lot of the conversations recently have stemmed around current demographics when we're talking about enrollment trends. Um, we need to make sure that we are looking at our current realities. So when we think about the black student identification on PALS being anywhere from 56% to 62%, and black student enrollment is at 49%. We are anywhere between 7% and 10% higher in identification. You ready to? I am an educator, an assistant principal, a teacher, an English teacher, a mother. And one of the ways that I loved to learn lessons and to teach them was by getting into another person's skin and walking around a bit, the way that Atticus told Scout to do in my favorite novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. So I would like to share a little bit of information with you through storytelling. Yes. I'm having trouble hearing. I'm sorry. Is this better? Should I lean in a little bit? I don't know if it's the mask. Is this better? It's okay. a little bit better. Thank you. I just didn't want to miss it. Yes, ma'am. So I want to bring you a little bit further into curriculum and instruction by calling your attention to the photographs on the screen. Notice in this moment the photograph of two children, one sitting proudly, tiny hand, proudly gripping a big boy baseball bat, one sitting in a big chair at a big desk in a big room. Now focus the mind on the faces of these children. There are several telltale signs that foreshadow the, the story of their smiles. Look closely. The faces have clues. On the left, you'll see the eyes dancing with anticipation, just waiting until this photograph is taken to share with you what the coach said, to ask if you saw what happened on the field, or to ask you if you guys can finally go for ice cream now. On the right, the secret is in the curve of his brow, the height of his cheekbones, or the way that he's leaning in as if he is inviting everyone to hear his story. Perhaps he just perfected the bunny ear methodology for tying shoes or was chosen to match the weather symbols to the weather outside in class today. Maybe he just completed a masterful, colorful piece of art, all beautifully designed outside the lines. These faces tell us that these children are proud of their accomplishments and anxious to share. Perhaps these faces are reminiscent of little ones near and dear to you, whose eyes dance when the recital date is given, the bat hits the ball, the prize was awarded, or the report card was shared. Whatever these faces are happy about, whatever the secret accomplishment of the day that's tucked away in those dimples is the very bit of truth and success that you are being invited to share. It's this love of learning and accomplishment that sets the stage for the bounty of lifelong growth that education has to offer. At the point of entering a school setting, whether that time is daycare, a preschool, kindergarten, 
or kindergarten, the relationship between student and learning is one that has become not only familiar, but celebrated. Each scaffolded level of advancement is more difficult than the previous one, yet somehow with blind faith, our students, the youngest of learners, climb each step eagerly with a self-motivation that inspires onlookers. It is this curiosity for life and learning that educators beyond these primary levels yearn to see in classrooms and educational departments spend countless hours devising plans to inspire. The stakes begin to change along the scaffolds of learning as the students get older and the prescription for success becomes more defined and inclusive of checkpoints along the way. It's these very delineations of educational levels that seem to change the eagerness of the learner. Thus, causing a hesitancy that allows the student to notice that not everyone is in that same space. And they wonder if they may or may not belong. But recall the excitement of that elementary child that you know, the one that climbs into your lap, the one that maybe you rock to sleep, the one that maybe you're hoping will hurry up and go to sleep, the one that can't wait to tell you the story, the one that just learned the song for the holiday play, the one that's excited about the new friend that they get to sit next to on the reading mat, because it's in elementary school at the reading level that sometimes we start to see that divide. The translation in levels in public education happens as early as elementary school, when students are separated based on varying reading levels. Students begin to pay attention to which students go to which groups during the reading class, as well as which students actually sound more like the teacher when they read versus the students who struggle with fluency. In the world of secondary education, these perceived levels become more concrete when the student leaves the elementary level and enters middle school. There the student is enrolled in classes based on whether or not they're deemed regular or advanced classes. At the high school level, there's an even more concrete plane with the introduction of advanced placement courses. The world of education begins fundamentally the same for students in K through 12 public education, at least in theory. Students have the ability to inform educational research departments and institutions on the requirements involved where there is a need to improve the quality of education and experiences as a whole. Student experience and voice matters. The demographics on that slide are real and they matter. I am a product of LCS. I remember sitting in classes at EC Glass and wondering and looking around. When I walk the halls, I still wonder as I look, and that's what led to my study. My study sought to inform education on the achievement gap by examining the enrollment gap between African American and white students in advanced placement courses through the lens of invitational theory. Invitational theory of practice refers to the idea of creating an environment that's conducive to helping others reach their full potential by actually inviting them to participate. With regard to education, we're actually looking at whether or not we are inviting all students to participate in all aspects of education. The simple question, do all students know what's on the menu? Have they been told? Are they clear about the benefits of what is out there and how it can help their future. My research partially replicated a study done by Molly Killingsworth in 2011, where she actually con she conducted a study where she was looking at the under-enrollment of African-American students in her division. She developed her own instrument. It was called the Program Access Survey, or PASS. Along with another researcher, Christy Cabasis, they developed this instrument in 2010. The survey consisted of three sections. It was a 36, item, uh, 36 items and it had six subsections. The, there was a five point Likert scale, one was strongly disagree all the way to five, which went to uh, agree. Section two contained various demographic items and the third section had an open ended question to access the respondents thoughts on what schools could do to encourage enrollments in AP courses. The survey measured student perspectives on the level to which they were to find their schools to be inviting and the items were designed according to the six elements that describe an inviting school based on the extensive research of Killingsworth and Cabasis. Those items are equity, enlistment, engagement, empowerment, and encouragement. 
I'm sorry, encouragement and enjoyment. My study was conducted at both high schools here in Lynchburg, and it had a statistically significant population of responses being 623 in a pandemic. There were four guiding questions in the research, and I'd like to share with you three powerful findings. In question number two, that specifically asked, what difference, if any, exists between minority and non-minority students' perceptions of the school environment? There were 16 statistically significant responses. 16. Of those 16, only one of them was from students who reported as black. And that one statement was, I feel encouraged to increase my grades when my parent encourages me. That fell, of course, in the domain of encouragement. The second that was statistically significant, as reported by students who rec recorded themselves as other, was my academic classes are too easy. That fell under the domain of enlistment. And those were the only two areas in which non-minority students had a reporting of an item that was found to be statistically significant, meaning those were the only two statements in which they recorded it with a four or a five. The third very powerful theme that emerged was that there were 386 students of the 623 who reported never having taken an AP course. And 51% of those students reported they weren't sure what they needed or they wanted to have someone talk to them about the benefits of taking an AP course. So what that said was that the students wanted to just have a conversation. So according to invitational theory, that tells us something very powerful that says in a global pandemic where we keep on hearing that the students aren't responding, that tells us that the students did respond. And it tells us that the students want more dialogue. It tells us that the students have something to say and they really want to interact, which is great news. It's not bad news. When I look at my city and I look at my LCS, when I look at the place that I went, the place that I graduated, the place that I teach, the place that I'm an administrator, I think it's wonderful news. I look at it from the standpoint of the students are inviting me in. The students are inviting us in. And now we get to, in turn, invite them to their education. So now we get to talk about what are the next steps? We'll do our best to do a socially distance dance at the podium. I would imagine you are tired of hearing us talk. Maybe tonight, maybe in general. We want to talk about some actionable next steps. What are we gonna do next? I want us to live our mission and our vision. Every child by name and by need to graduation and beyond. We need to live that. It's an amazing mission. We need to make sure every day we come to work, every day that you all do the work of the board, every day that we invest in LCS, we need to make sure that that is our mission. <clears throat> our vision is a tradition of excellence for all. I don't want us to change that. If we're currently living a tradition of excellence for some, we need to act and make sure that we are providing excellence for all. There are many ways to measure excellence. AP is one way. It's not the only way. We have many ways that I just mentioned that we can measure excellence. <clears throat> we have a list of core values, integrity, respect, teamwork, working together to accomplish our common goal. Learning 
is a core value that we're gonna learn together. So first, I want us to commit to doing the work that we say in our, in our mission, our vision, and our core values. Intentionality. I'm excited about doing the work. When I was at EC Glass, I had a Roger Jones to tell me when I was inside of the building that I could go anywhere. I had a mother at home to tell me that I could go anywhere. I had friends in class. I had an Yvette Miller in the counseling office to tell me that I could go anywhere. I actually had opportunities to see myself at any of the tables. I got a chance to go places and to see things and to imagine myself in places. And I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to create that for our students. The demographic of our division has changed. It doesn't mean that if we're creating opportunities for students, that we're leaving anyone behind. What it means is that we're creating opportunities for all students. Intentionality through our people. When we're taking a look at what the findings say, we have to understand that if we can reach students because they say that I, I'm really moved by my coach, I'm really moved by my math teacher, I'm really moved by my parent, then that's who we invite to the table. We use our people. Our community, our community, they're our people. Our community are also our places. We've got great information inside of our buildings. We've got the power inside of our buildings. We can extend our buildings into our community. Our community can become our learning spaces because our community already has spaces that are our safe spaces for our children. We can work with our community. We can work with our parents. Parental involvement doesn't just mean that the parents have to come to the schools. Community involvement can mean that we're helping our parents to learn how to teach our children. That's empowerment. That's how we reach out into those domains. Because as educators, we have some of that magic that we keep telling the children that, that, that you know, they have. They've given us the invitation to talk to them in the 623 responses. We can listen to the power of the parent encouragement. We can invite them to the table. We can listen to the students saying that things are easy. We can invite them to the table. We can invite grit into the lessons. We can invite them to do the heavy lifting and then be their cheerleaders. We can listen to the students that want to be heard to the students that came out in a pandemic and they responded. We can invite them to create, to do, and to give feedback. We can focus on our assets. We have a lot of assets at our fingertips. We can focus on our strengths as a division. We can focus on individual student strengths. We absolutely have to address our deficits, but what we focus on is what will grow. We cannot talk about Lynchburg City Schools as a failing school division. We are not failing. Our students are not failures. We have to look at potential. We have to look at promise. We have to be committed to looking for assets. We have to have brave leadership. I know we have brave leaders. We also have to be brave leaders. We have to want transformation. We have to want things that are visionary. We have to think outside of the box. I don't know in 2021 if there is still a box. I think we've thought outside of the box for a really long time now. We don't have to go back thinking inside of the box anymore. We have to focus on tier one instruction. That's on me. That's on the curriculum and instruction team. That's that's a priority. <clears throat> we should be 
meeting students' needs in the classroom. We should be remediating or intervening on small percentages of students. We're going to have to intervene more because of pandemic learning loss. We're going to have to intervene more between now and let's say December of 2021. But we have to make sure that students, every student, is receiving quality tier one instruction. We worked with a really powerful consultant last year, and he said something to me that will always resonate. If you think about foundational learning skills, like crossing the street safely, <clears throat> is it okay for eight out of 10 students to cross the street safely? Is it okay for your child or grandchild to cross the street safely eight out of 10 times? No, it is not. If we think about foundational skills, foundational academics, as important as crossing the street safely, we will guarantee that students have the priorities, have the foundation. We have to focus on outcomes. I love talking as much as anybody, but we have to do more than talk. We have to report more often to our stakeholders. You are a stakeholder. Our organization, within the organization, we need to report to each other. We need to make sure that parents are aware of student assessments, what they mean, that we're celebrating growth. And as Kenya just talked about, we absolutely need to make sure that we are reporting opportunities to our stakeholders, making sure that the community, the parents, the counselors, the teachers, the coaches realize the impact that they're having on students. 600 and 23 responses. Optional survey. Our students want to be heard and our students are worth it. When we focus on outcomes, we will have data. We will have upcoming data sets. We will have Spring Pals data that we'll be able to share by mid-June, definitely July, we'll have summer school outcome or impact reports that we can share when summer school is over. I would like to ask you a strange question. Would you like to have some more meetings to talk about data? I would like to have regular meetings with you I would like to have regular meetings where we take deep dives into data, where we meet with stakeholders, where we meet with principals, where we look at various measures. And I don't know the right term for it. I don't know how you get a committee, but if finance gets a committee, can we get a student achievement committee, even if it only meets for a year, or maybe it meets for two years and we, we have a trial. Um, but I don't think it's enough to come to you once a year. I don't think it's enough to come to you and talk about what's already happened. I think you need to know what's happening along the way. It increases accountability. It increases accountability for me. It makes me a little bit nervous, but I'm willing to do the hard work. I think you're willing to do the hard work. Even as adults, we get excited when you guys come to our building. We're excited because we feel like we invited you and you chose us and we're all grown. You know, I graduated 30 years ago 
from E.C. Glass High School. And Dr. Owen Cardwell, who integrated E.C. Glass High School, called me Dr. Fowler Parks. And I felt like I was that little boy on the screen. And Dr. Roger Jones called me Dr. Fowler Parks. And I felt like I was that little boy on the screen. And before you all sat down here tonight, Superintendent of the Year, Dr. Crystal Edwards, stood on the stage and called me Dr. Fowler Parks. And I felt like I was that little boy on the screen. It feels good to be invited. It feels good to be acknowledged. It feels good at any age. I want to be a part of the LCS that makes my students feel the way you guys make us feel. I want to be a part of the LCS that makes our students feel proud to be products of the LCS that watched us walk all the way through. And I think that right now, when we take a look at those two on the screen, at Nick Jordan and Jax Fowler, who are now 12 years old, who haven't been in school in a year, just like all of our students, they're coming to us right now, not having really been in school last year, but they're coming to us in a space where they haven't known traditional school in a year. All of them, that we can invite them to an education that feels different because we're in a space now where we've seen what education looks like in a very different way. They are our why. Dr. Jordan's why, my why, those little ones that I asked you to think about, they are our why. Your whys are our whys. The community's whys, they are our whys. We are committed to doing something very different and we would love to do it together. We would love to do it along with you, alongside you, with the community and by inviting our children to the table, to their education so that we can create something for them very differently. We would like for them to see that we've worked very hard so that we can watch not only them, but their friends and their children to come all the way through. We want to welcome them into the fellowship as well. Because one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright, as Amanda Gorman told us this year at the inauguration. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Jordan and Dr. Fowler-Parks. Before we open the floor for board members to share, Dr. Edwards, in relationship to our governance working group, I believe that's the working group that would review committees. Yes. And so I believe I heard uh, Dr. Jordan mention a student achievement committee, and I would uh, recommend that the uh, governance working group uh, convene to look at that and then bring it to the full board for uh, consideration as it has been our custom. I know that everyone wants to say something and so, so that everyone can do that and we can just do it orderly. And if we need to come back around, we can. Or if you just got something so burning, you can butt in. But I would like to start with Mr. Harvey and just work our way around. That way everyone will have a chance and, and we can go at it that way. Mr. Harvey. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciated uh, the presentation tonight and especially all the data. Uh, I'm kind of a data geek to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, the thing that really, that really stood out to me is that economically disadvantaged factor. You know, that is such a challenging factor. And, you know, with my experience with working with young people, um, specifically through scouting, the, the scouts that I worked with that, that come from economically disadvantaged households always had more of a challenge. And that challenge was because the struggle with support from home. 
And that could be for many reasons, but a lot of it was because parents had second jobs or parents were away in the evenings. Um, they weren't able to attend what are called courts of honor where awards are given for achievement. Parental support, and I'm gonna take that further to say mentor support is so absolutely critical just someone showing that they care. And that's why I really appreciate with your presentation tonight. All of us as citizens of Lynchburg City can show support as mentors, show support as encouragers to all of our students. And it's a tough thing for us to do because I know on this board, we have to look at data. We have to look at, um, success rates and failure rates and all of that. But when that does become the focus, it really is a struggle. That's the message that gets heard all the time. That's the message that appears in the paper. That's the message that, are, that appears on the TV, on the radio, is failure, failure, failure. And we, we have got to, and I think that's one of the points that you really are trying to hammer home, We've got to stop that. We've got to start talking about the successes in LCS. And we've got to start talking about successful mentoring and encourage all adults within our city to be a mentor to a young person, especially one that might not have that special coach or someone else in their lives to be a mentor. And, and there's so many opportunities that we can do that. Um, I just really hope that everyone will get vaccinated and things will get back where we can get back into our schools where we can mentor because I know for myself, I struggle with mentoring simply by sending care packages to my lunch buddy, you know, not being able to actually sit and participate and play games in person. I really hope we can do that. But that, that economically disadvantaged number I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the giant in the room, and, and that's a giant we've got to somehow slay, and I'm not, I'm not sure how we even go about doing that, but the data shows us that that is a critical aspect of this. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Dr. Gupta. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jordan, for your presentation. Uh, I was looking for some hard data on achievement gap. I ap apologize if I missed it. Between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, do you happen to have the data? Would you be able to share with us, if not today, later on? And uh, that'll give us what we need to do in terms of your steps, next steps, action plan. I don't have SOL data i could show pals is probably the data set that i can show longitudinally and we'll have the spring administration data but that won't be until about june um i do have i'm trying to think let let me work on that with karen bucklew our assessment and data guru, and I'll see what I, I can get to you. I'm not sure that we have many measures post-pandemic, but we have some before and during. Because I've seen the risk ratio, but the, uh, to see the correlation between them and the actual scores, I'm assuming you'll have the data pre-2021, uh, the SOL longitudinal data for previous three, four, five years, so we can see where the achievement gap stands in the city of Lynchburg. Uh, it could be good, it could be bad, but it, it helps us in planning going forward. Would it help to see risk ratio data prior to 2019? Is, would that help? Risk ratio is just, I know certain populations are at risk. From your risk ratio here, you can see that, and that has been the uh, sort of a, a layman's prediction but correlating it with the actual SOL data or the achievement data you have for the last four or five years will tell us uh, what should be our action plan. It may be a socioeconomic thing. You know, we need to go back 
into the community, but having the CARES money now at our disposal, the things we can do which we couldn't do before, but to even, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the committee, and I agree if the committee is an option, but I don't want to go to the dining table without any food on the table. And I'm a, I'm a quantitative guy, so I'd like to see some numbers uh, before we uh, go in that direction, or I support that direction. So, Dr. Gupta, if I can just jump in here for a second, because we did not take the SOL, so we're, we're kind of missing that gap data that would say here was the bench line in fall 2019 and then fall 2020 and, and where we are. So that part we don't have just because we didn't give it as a state. However, some of the things that we are looking at, and it was it's actually a good thing that we had a an SOL pause, so to speak, because it showed us that we may be relying too heavily on what I call the autopsy data, which is the test at the end of the year. So some of the things we're looking at, and I shared this with you all personally in my evaluation documents, are the growth data that's from fall to spring, um, which is really what the conversations this year have been about because we don't have the SOL data. So we are looking at, and in, in particular, just speaking through some of the things that I've shared with you, looking at math and the number of children who have shown growth between um, taking a test in, in early fall and December, and then of course spring being um, February, March, and seeing what percentage of students have made half a year's growth, which is really where we are predicting where they would be, what have made a year's growth, and what have made what percent of students have made more than that, and of course what students aren't growing, and then what we're doing in real time to assist the kids who aren't showing growth. So that data is, exists um, in, in pockets. It depends on the grade level, obviously, a different at elementary level, but the we won't have the core complete division-wide data, because everybody in the division takes the SOL test until um, the completion of the SOL, te SOL test in the current spring. So do you have a depository of your previous three, four years of SOL hard data? So when this mm -hmm. data non-SOL comes, mm -hmm. we can compare? Yes, yes. And contrast, see what needs to be done and what has happened. Yes, and we have that, and I think one of the things I also shared with you and have shared with you in the past is just not only the actual SOL data, but it breaks it apart by um, achievement gaps in English and in math as well. So you can see, and, and I can sh show you those charts again where those are publicly available on, this, on the state website. Um, but when we get the new data for the current year, it'll be interesting to see. I also shared with you just some very preliminary data looking at the right, um, sorry, the reading assessment at a high school level for our current kids. Um, and just, because we're taking the SOLs now, and we'll be taking them to the end of May, pretty much, um, with the schedule that we have. And that's kids who are in-person and remote kids. And the way that we're looking at the data is for both, to see, you know, the hybrid in-person children, how they perform, the remote learning, the kids who re perform remote only all year long, how they perform. So we will have that data, but we do, we're in the process of assessing kids now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Um, yeah, um, so the PALS data is only for younger elementary, and I think in your, your just made remarks, you said there's something equivalent to that for upper levels. Because one thing I'm seeing, I'm, of course I have to look at the data more clearly, it looks like not only do we have this gap that persists between um, students of color and economically disadvantaged, that gap seems to worsen at the middle school stage. Um, so that's a concern that we need to look at. I know we've um, done a lot of trying to really bolster the early education because you know, you don't want those gaps to be cumulative, but to a certain extent, they appear to be cumulative. Um, and then I'd, I would also be interested in looking at the, because these are not mutually exclusive 
groups, the racial categories probably are, although Hispanic can be of any race. Um, but economically disadvantaged, it would be in, I would be interested to see um, uh, the ethnic and racial groups perhaps disaggregated by that measure to a certain degree to look at, um, you know, are there, I don't know, to, to sort of get at the root problem. And I believe it's, it's the economically disadvantaged. Poverty is toxic. Um, it's limiting, um, whatever. So I, I would be curious to see that. And since we have significantly higher percentages of both groups, I think that we can safely disaggregate without, um, while still maintaining an anonymity in the, in the, in the results. Um, and then it just, I don't know how there's a better way um, you know, the SOLs really trouble me because they're a high stakes test. And as somebody who, in spite of myself, has managed to achieve, I score terrible on high stakes tests. I did not do well on the SAT. I did not do well on the GRE. And, and if you look at my scores on aptitude tests all through K-12, I did not do well on them. I'm just one of those people. And yet, I was not disadvantaged, I was not poor, I'm white. I had very, you know, parents who were really big on reading and enrichment and that kind of stuff. So, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I, 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 I struggle with that as the measure of, of of how we're doing. And so I would really like to see more of the data of regular assessments that are taken throughout the year of the students and perhaps a more informal, less anxiety evoking ways to see how, how that's happening. And you actually bring up an excellent point. Um, there's far more consistent assessment data at an elementary level than there are once you start middle and high school and you start differentiating into programs, um, you know, you have algebra versus geometry, the, the assessment data gets to be a little bit more difficult to have it if it's not SOL um, data. And then, of course, just, you know, as a division, being able to implement that across a division, across schools, with fidelity everywhere is where, where we need to be. I'm not saying that we are 100% there, mm -hmm. because we aren't. Um, and then lastly, sticking with something, picking an assessment tool that you are committed to keep over multiple years so that you can look longitudinally at a group of children. Part of the challenge with F SOLs is you're looking at, you know, let's say fourth grade, and then next year, you're looking at a whole different fourth grade, and you're trying to make a judgment call on how fourth grade went when you're looking at two sets of kids as opposed to looking at fourth grade in one year and then their growth as they become fifth graders the next year. And I know the state is moving to more of a growth assessment. We're trying to get a little bit ahead of them with some of the things that we're doing. Um, so some of the questions that I've asked in just in some of the great work that the principals are doing at the school levels are really looking at that mid-year, how do you know? How do you know they're progressing mid-year? They have targets for children and they're determining how many kids have reached their targets. Um, and then what do we need to do? Because ultimately we can have conversations about these numbers, but if we don't have a response to what we're doing about them, we're just having conversations about numbers. Uh, and that is the direction that we are moving into in terms of our response. And a lot of that work was done before we brought kids back four days a week, um, officially four days a week. Much of the data was used to make those decisions and make those phone calls to get kids in four days a week because we saw they weren't meeting their targets. And, and again, trying to share with the board, there's, there's lots, and you can imagine uh, principals have what they call their daytronic, and some of them are walls that actually have things posted on it. But I really tried this year to give the board little samples and pictures of 
this is what I see. This is what Dr. Jordan sees. These are the conversations that we have. These are the questions that building principals have to raise with their staff to move the needle. Because if individual schools are laser focused, the vision scores go up. All right? So we really need to concentrate on those individual schools and what those schools need um, in terms of that. But we also do need to be consistent with implementation of an assessment program that will allow us to follow kids over multiple years. Oh, just a couple more things. I, I went to that website and I downloaded data, but I didn't see any reports that show the risk ratios. Um, so um, it would be helpful to have that applied to the test scores. And then I was curious, I know you probably can't answer this question, but how do performance or risk ratios or SOL scores, how well do they correlate to actual grades in a course? Is there a, is it pretty indicative or consistent or is there, is there a disagreement between that and, and how, would, how would that be interpreted? And then finally, um, this is just a minor, well, it would have been helpful to have the presentation as part of our board docs. It's not always easy, and I know Dr. Nillis and you guys sitting there can't even see the screen. So for future presentations, I would like to see it be a requirement that that be part of, now that we have the board docs platform, we can open up PDFs or PowerPoints, and, and that would be real helpful for following along. Yeah, point well taken, because I realize that Dr. Nellis does not have a good line of sight between the three of us blocking no, and the screen. Even me, I have bad eyes, so just looking at that screen. So I did follow along on the, um, on the live feed, but it's delayed by a, a, a way, so okay. at any rate. I apologize you. for that. The entire item was blank on board docs. I, I apologize. Bef uh, thank you, Dr. Senha. Uh, Dr. Gupta, you have a suggestion? Suggestion follow-up. I understand the problem because of grades, but uh, how about dividing them as cohorts? So you follow a student's progress throughout the LCS journey from fourth grade to fifth grade to sixth grade. So instead of, you know, so mm, that yes. all the problem. You had me at hello. That's, that is the type of growth data that we want to look at and see but it will also be helpful to look at that through the lens of summer and get the effect of our summer programming and seeing, because there's always the summer slide for kids, um, and, that, and that grows dependent upon some of those fact, risk factors um, for that. So yes, Dr. Gupta, we are, we are on that. Dr. Nillis. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think it shows a real commitment uh, on, to the students themselves. Um, my questions were, have kind of already been addressed by what some remarks um, Dr. Edwards has made. Um, but, you know, so there's a lot of measures that are being used for student assessment, and one obvious question is what's the best measure, benchmark, whatever you want to call it, that correlates with SOL outcomes? And then, then through the year, how are you, you know, what, what I think the board would be interested in would be, you know, how are, how's the data being used? How are the, the how is the instruction being adjusted? Um, what are the principals doing to help the teachers, you know, become better instructors? I mean, and this ties in with block schedules, it ties in with the reading curriculum. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm looking for is, uh, you know, I appreciated the story, but like, how's it really being used day to day uh, in, in the buildings? And, and I assume you're going to use the, the data from a standpoint of, of setting some goals and setting some long-term goals, but um, the students are assessed regularly. So I'm just wondering if there's a look at how those assessments basically track, you know, the end of the year. 
So I can address that a little bit. One of the things that I shared with you, again, just for evaluation purposes, is the um, what one principal shared was the way that they monitor quarter, quarterly progress monitoring. And you can see some, and it might not make sense to you all because you don't have the, all the backstory. So that's one of the difficulties of sharing um, some of this with you that you may not understand the coding. Um, but they do look at the progress of their children over each quarter in certain areas, the effectiveness of whether or not if they had an after school or a Saturday program. And I think one of the things you might see in here is Saturday program was not well attended. So they are constantly looking at one of our responses was to put in a Saturday program. Let's see how that's going. We're having trouble with attendance. Got to go back and revisit that. In some cases, it might be if they notice some patterns in particular classrooms, the instructional coach might have been assigned to go into the classroom and work directly with the teacher and the students, and then they cycle back to see how that progress goes. So much of the how do we use the data, and, and Dr. Nils, you bring up a great point because you sound like me. These are the things that I want to know as well. Um, is done at the building level in real time. And I think that's what Dr. Jordan is getting at when she says it's very hard for us to come and do a 90 minute, even though we're probably over 90, uh, data presentation. It's much more palatable to break it down in smaller pieces where you can actually have those questions that say, okay, so when we did our mid year progress monitoring and we noticed that these children were colored green, these children were colored yellow, and these were colored red. Now what? What did we do? So what? And then what's the next step to monitor them and having those conversations with um, building leaders and their teams to really show what we're doing about some of the, the learning loss, but not just the learning loss. I, I don't want it to be missed that what happens if it's fall and I'm knocking it out the park? What are you doing for me? Um, what are you doing to enrich my education if I've already achieved some of the goals and I'm slated to be advanced proficient on the SOLs? How do, how, do, how do you ensure every child by name and by need? How are you meeting my needs? So it gives us an opportunity to look at all of that. Anything else, Dr. Nillis? No, no, thank you. you thank you, Dr. Brennan. I just want to thank Dr. Jordan and our colleague for the presentation and for their enthusiasm. I know that there's a big job and it's a big project, but I know that, that we will see more information and see, I'm sure, good information. I have nothing else to add other than what my colleagues had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Dr. Carter. My concern is, or what I'm interested in seeing or hearing, is what we are doing. Because looking at their research brief from UVA, they really were putting those things out to talk about the takeaways and how much loss there's going to be and looking at the number of students from kindergarten and first grade, second grade that will have um, significant problems with reading if it's not addressed. So my question is, what are we doing to address it? It says effective interventions are needed. So what are the effective interventions that we've come up with that's going to really prevent or stop this loss? So what is our next steps? And I was questioning whether or not the PALS test is the best, but I see where 131 out of 132 schools use that. So I was just wondering what that other school uses instead of the PALS test, of, but all 131 out of 132 uses it, it says. Uh, because some tests may have a cultural background or a different target, so I just wanted to know, is it relevant to the kids? And, then the other thing is um, that was talked about was saying that one of the, on the study or the presentation that you gave, and I forgot your name, sorry, but it talked about one of the um, significant takeaways was, or the inputs from the students was the fact that they wanted someone to just talk about the options that were available. And I know a lot of times when students go to start to pick classes, it's not a time for discussion. They're just looking at, I don't know what they look at. And before, surely, sometimes, and I may be wrong, but by the time you get there, your course is already set out. So there's no discussion that pretty much here, this is what you're taking. Okay, we'll see you later. And some students, they may have the 
uh, ability and just, just be assertive enough to say, no, that's not what I want. And some may not, and they just may go on. And then the other thing is, if there is an expo exploration or someone is trying to give them more insight and feedback as to different courses they can take, how does this trickle down to the teachers when they see a student that's not supposed to be in that class? Will the teacher, are they ready to buy into that and work with that student or they say, so I don't know why you're here anyway, and make the child stay a living nightmare until the child just says, well, forget it. The teacher always says, they don't know how I got in here anyway. And some, some students have said that, that the teachers have said, I don't know how you even got in this class. So those things. <laughs> I will address the first few questions and then I will rely on Kenya to address her survey um, data. What are we doing to address learning loss? Bringing students back four days a week, um, priority standards this year, really focusing on the foundational skills that are necessary for success at the next level, at the next course. We are planning a robust summer program. That is what I've been knee deep in for months. I'm really, really excited about summer opportunities. Um, summer slide has been a way that we describe learning loss um, in traditional years. We cannot afford for students to have summer slide on top of any learning loss that we've seen. We are um, experiencing some of the trends that um, we heard last March or April that math would be more impacted. We're starting, we're seeing it. Um, so locally, we're seeing a larger regression in math and math is not in our everyday worlds as much as reading is. And we've talked a lot in my, in my team in meetings about students are having to read so much this year. We're having to read so much this year on the screen. Um, so we're not seeing the same levels of regression in reading. So we definitely want to make sure that we're addressing both reading and math because we're seeing slides there. Um, we have embedded learning experiences into third, fourth, and fifth grades because Dr. Sinha, you are correct. The gaps appear to widen as we get into upper elementary school. You transition from learning to read, um, to reading to learn. So we have purchased resources, embedded them in classroom instruction, and they will also go home to families that pair a reading selection with an activity. So third grade, every third grader in Lynchburg City Schools is getting a really neat book about math. It's math in the world around you. So for example, a pizza and how you do fraction work with that or a fence and how you measure or look at perimeter. Um, and so there are math activities, fraction cubes that, that go with that book. We've got a fourth grade, Goodnight Lynchburg, as well as a weather kit. So they're studying weather as well as reading about the city of Lynchburg. In fifth grade, it is um, a book about wind and it's a windmill kit. So whereas we've always bought resources, we've not always done the intentional making sure everybody gets the same one. It's embedded in classroom instruction. So you hear your teacher talking about it, you see your teacher doing it, and you get to take it home. And we hope that families with multiple children get to experience multiple resources. Um, so those are just a few things. I would say summer school is the main way we're trying to combat learning loss and making sure that we're, we're turning the tides. We don't want to see any summer slide. PALS, 
that, we could go on for days about literacy assessments. PALS, we have successful implementation. It is very well received in Virginia. It's almost universally adopted. I thought the same thing, who's the division that doesn't do it, but I'm not gonna bring that up here. Um, PALS is being revamped. Um, so is it the best measure? Probably not. Is it a measure that we have historical data on? Yes. So UVA is committed to revamping the assessment. Um, we purchased the foundations and just words materials. Those will also have assessments that go along with them. If you triangulate using PALS, and you look at something like IXL, which is a vendor, but that's a continuous diagnostic that shows us a grade level equivalent, and we do something like a running records, or we do dibbles, there are many ways that you can measure similar skills. If you look at, are the results similar? Are we seeing PALS is um, what's the right way to say it? PALS is probably a little bit more lenient. Um, if a student is below the benchmark in PALS, it's a significant concern. Um, but there's a lot of talk about making sure that, that PALS is, is renormed and revamped. Um, Kenya, I'll let you talk about the question about the study. Thank you, Dr. Carter. That was a, a very powerful, another very powerful point in my study. Two of the items on the 36 item pass survey stated, my counselor or teacher has talked to me about the benefits of taking AP courses. My counselor or teacher has talked to my parent about the benefits of taking AP courses. And students responded to those items, again, on the, the using the Likert um, scale. What the power in that becomes the power of conversation. And so what happens is, if someone is speaking to me, particularly speaking to my parent, about the benefits of anything, then that becomes conversation. So even if you tell me, I'm gonna run home and tell my parent, because I was just that kid, you know, so that, that starts conversation. Or it's gonna start conversation among my friend group so even at my lunch table, it's a conversation among my friend group. It becomes conversation among the friend group with my parents. It becomes a commonality now. So we're talking about, and it doesn't just have to be AP, dual enrollment, advanced classes, STEM, the governor's school. You, you can take in any measure and swap it out for another one. But if I don't know anything about it, there's nothing for me to talk about. There's no conversation about it. It doesn't become co a commonality in my world. So I'm not talking about it with my friends. There's no likelihood that I'm gonna know anything about it. I need to see it. As I was saying, I need to be able to see myself in, in various spaces. And so the responses to those particular items, also very telling, um, another aspect of the study which was also why we are interested in inviting students to the table. It was powerful that, um, as Dr. Jordan was saying, the absence of data is data. The students who were saying, I, I don't know what it is that I need. You know, I, I just want somebody to, to talk to me about what it is that, that I need. And some of the ways that we can address current situations and, and disarm everyone is to just take the information that we have and move forward. So here's what we do. We start talking to students about what their options are early. We start making their options known to them at the elementary level. Elementary kids see themselves being Superman. They see themselves <laughs> being chefs. You know, they can see themselves being anything. It's as we get older that life then starts to hinder us. And you know, we stop putting on that cape somewhere along the line, but you know, that toddler puts that cape on and will seize the day. So I think that early on, we start 
talking to students about where they can go and what those benefits are. We keep talking to them at that middle school level where that weirdness happens, where, where they really do start to see that separation that I talked about with those advanced in those regular classes. And now all of a sudden, my friend's not next to me on the reading mat and now she's across the hall and I'm a little bit confused why I wasn't invited over there, but we start those conversations early and then we don't need to address what happened because we know better and so we just do better. And so hopefully we can invite children to the table and now just move forward with that. And if, if I could just kind of co-sign and I appreciate uh, Dr. Fowler being here, she's, she's probably like, ooh, how did I get invited to the CNI conversation? But one of the things that you all hear me say a lot is you cannot fix what you don't first acknowledge. And an acknowledgement sometimes starts with a brave soul that says, I'm gonna look into this, but I may not like what I find, and I may not want to talk about it publicly or you know, just, just out loud. And I, I appreciate her when she first told me what her study was, and I said, I would grant it, but you must do both high schools and you must share. And I don't care what the results are, we just need to know the honest, what are our children feeling? What are they saying about being invited and included? And we had to, we, you know, we may not have liked everything, and I'm sure some of those conversations might have been a little difficult to have, but these are real children, these are real experiences. So I hope this board is at least seeing if nothing else, there's a set of bravery that's out there that says we will bring you the tough conversations and acknowledge where the, the failures and the missteps are. You just saw that with, with uh, Mr. Gasky and Mr. A, who just, this is where we drop the ball. Uh, and that's a start to improvement uh, along the way. So I, I do want to thank them. And as more of our staff pursue advanced study, and if their work in any way can help us be better leaders, I am certainly going to continue to encourage that. And well, I might be discouraging them if I'm telling them I'm going to invite them here um, to share with you all some of their findings. So thank you for being here tonight. Anything else, Dr. Carter? Just one more. I think that sometimes students can go to the summer classes, they can go to get classes, but some of them just need the techniques. I know one student that struggled with algebra and they went to summer school and summer school and did all this. And one teacher, and this was at EC Glass, she had a, a remedial class and she showed them the proper techniques. And from then on, this student was just, she said if she had known this, just how the techniques of it, that she wouldn't have had a problem. So some students can read and read and read, and if they don't know there are certain ways to do it, a certain, then they're just, they're reading, but they may not be as fluent or as uh, comfortable or confident until they learn certain, like cert some people just need certain things. So hopefully, we can look at that and try to see what a student needs uh, while they're going to all of these things. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Mrs. Morrison. Thank you both for um, bringing the data to the forefront and not being afraid to have conversations about more than numbers. Um, I worked with data most of my professional career but probably did not understand it in terms of numbers. What I wanted was to know what I needed to do to help that student do better than what that data indicated. And I think that acknowledging learning loss and promoting enrichment opportunities is the right thing to do. I really appreciate the conversation starting early. You cannot wait till the student in fifth grade picks classes for the middle school and then say, no, we want you to go this way when we've not been talking about it as early as we possibly can with both students and parents, because I think a lot of times the parents don't understand the courses and where they're leading and what that implies for down the road. I do think that there are important people in the schools, the teachers and the administrators who are constantly looking at data. I remember pre-pandemic looking at the war rooms 
and being invited to come into the war rooms at the schools where I was uh, invited in, and it was very helpful. I did not get to go because all at once we weren't in school. And I do think that's important for us to re recognize that work is going on every day, that teachers and administrators and students are working hard at what they have to do better. I just think that it's gonna take time and it's starting with the honest conversation and the data not being manipulated so that we look better than we are, that we get it honestly and I appreciate that. And thank you both um, for being here tonight and for sharing. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Mrs. Evans. Um, I will say thank you as well. You asked the question, were we surprised by what we saw? And I, for one, was not at all. Um, and I think we've talked about it many times. I'm gonna agree with Mike a little bit of the ready to hear what we can do and not just what these numbers are. Um, I, I love a ton of your ideas, especially talking to the students early, doing these things, but I hate the thought of these being ideas. Yes, they sound great. I feel like it's up to us as a school board to put policies in place to make these things happen. Um, I think we can't just say that sounds great. We have to say this is what we expect for our schools to do. If we're going to start in elementary, it's not going to be because this elementary school thinks it's a great idea and they take it on for this group of kids. So you're going to get to high school with some of them having this, some of them not having this. I think we need to be consistent across the board for all students. And I know a lot we've talked about students who are at risk and you even talked about students who needed enrichment and being able to get it. We have a ton of average students, and I feel like a lot of times they are just kind of out there floating because they're doing okay. They're doing okay. But if we had those things in place that we could actually push that average student up to the advanced classes, give them opportunities, I think we just need to remember there are a lot of average ones there too that we also need these same opportunities for. And we keep talking a lot about the learning loss in the summer, and I know it's gonna be huge, but I think these are changes that have to be the duration. This is not just because of learning loss. These scores are not because of learning loss. This is what we're facing as a school system. We have to put things in place that will change this. And I just feel like it's gotta be very, calculated and planned out and consistent school to school to school. And when you're talking about having a board with people on it for these numbers and working on it, I would be the first to sign up. I think it's in, so important. And we've talked about you know, the discrepancy between groups and this is something that we've talked about for three years. So I just wanna make sure we're not looking at the data and talking about it. We, you know, we want to be a part of what is this action that we're doing. Let's come up with these ideas. And, you know, I just very quickly will say at the high school level, level, when you talked about the students wanting somebody to talk to them about the classes, I think it's up to us. We have how many, four guidance counselors at EC class? I don't know how, maybe four or five. I don't know how many Heritage has. It's impossible for us to ask them to do that job of talking to every student about every class of every opportunity. We've got to figure out other ways to reach everyone. So everybody feels welcome at the table and discussed. And I just think we need to start thinking kind of outside of the box, which you said there was no box left, and I agree. We need to think about how we're gonna all work with these kids. And it's not just up to the guidance counselors, it's up to everybody. So I'm excited uh, you know, about y'all's ideas and what you're saying. I just don't want us to be like, these are the ideas, and we just kind of, there we are. Um, so that's just my concern. I, I wanna see us follow through with is, you know, let's make these changes, not just because of COVID, not just because of learning loss, but because this is what our kids need. So Ms. Evans, I just wanna thank you for saying that because it, we, what may be required is a cultural mind shift of what you measure, right? 
And if you think through, and I gave this example to Dr. Coleman this morning, you know, if I want to decrease by 30 pounds, I could step on the scale every day and measure that and then come back and report what my weight is. But stepping on the scale is not the thing that's going to cause the weight loss. But if my measurement is, if that's the thing that I measure, that's where my attention goes. But if I really wanted to say that, okay, I'm going to make a correlation that if I change my junk food habits and decrease the amount of potato chips I eat or whatever that is, if I increase my exercise and make sure that I'm doing at least 30 minutes of cardio strength training twice a week, and I commit to measuring that, that's what I'm gonna keep my data on, my behaviors. And then as a result of those behaviors, if I'm consistent with those, the hope is that yes, these are the things that we predicted will, will lead to weight loss. So the same thing with um, education. We write wonderful goals about increasing or decreasing failure rates, increasing SOL test scores when Really, when you dig deep at a level that's at the building level, you want to improve writing and you think that conferencing with kids about their writing and having kids do a rewrite, a draft, and they need to respond to it at least three times, if that's what you're measuring to see across the board, are kids and teachers doing that with fidelity? And if the answer is yes, you should start to see an improvement in the writing score. So some of what we might um, start to see is a shift in what we call a goal and not uh, the ultimate goal. Yes, we do want SOL test scores to go up, um, but really we want to focus on what are the behaviors and habits that we have to have as students and staff working with children that are going to lead to that progress. And I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit because what might work with consistency and fidelity at RS Pain might be different at Paul Monroe. And although the strategies might be the same, I really need to look at what the children need there and make sure that I'm giving them, um, we are implementing what they need. And that's why I don't want to lose, and you brought up the average children, I don't want to lose growth in our conversation because all students should be growing and our, our efforts should be to move them to the next level of what that next level for them is. Just real quick, I just want to make it clear. I didn't mean it had to be the same at every school. Okay. But the goal needed to be the same at every school. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, as we begin to wrap up this section of our agenda, I do want to ask any other comments from any of the board members. Mr. Harvey. I mean, a couple, couple things that just really just keep pounding in my head here. I kept hearing the word assessment. Assessment, 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 and, and I wrote equals test. It's an autopsy report. All, a lot of the data that we have is an autopsy report, and that's why I really like what Dr. Edwards is saying. Let's, let's get a health check. Let's not have an autopsy report, and let's not base all of our discussions on an autopsy report. Now, we take all this data and span it over a lifetime of a student, then we, that does become a health check to a certain degree. So I do think taking a lot of this information and a lot of this data over the long haul can be positive, but we need to be able to get that health check. And so one of the things that, that keeps, keeps sticking in my head here is how can we do assessments that are in real time that address more than just the bad test taker, as Dr. Sinha mentioned, you know? Um, is, is there a way that we can use human power in our assessments a lot more? And I think this kind of ties in a little bit with, with what Ms. Evans is making, a point that she's making with the guidance counselors at our high schools. I mean, it is a Herculean task to try to get the schedules of all of those students and give them the time to sit there and talk to them about the possibilities of AP classes and the possibilities of other opportunities, other enrichments. You know, we're talking about arts, we're talking about CTE, we're talking about opportunities. And, and as soon as I hear talking to students about opportunities, I immediately think our guidance counselors. You know, I, I immediately go there and man, they're gonna be, that's, they are overloaded already. And maybe, you know, what do we do 
when we're talking about what do we do, maybe that's what we need to be doing. Maybe we need to be focusing more on how we provide our students with more coaches, not necessarily instructional people, but more coaches to help them talk about what are the opportunities, what are the possibilities, what, what, what can you do to challenge yourself. You know, we, I, 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 I've heard several times we talk about diversity at the governor's school. If we want to change and make diversity at the Gov school, we've got to provide our students, our diverse students, the opportunities at a younger age. We need to inspire them in elementary school that they can be in the Gov school. Waiting till they're in ninth grade and trying to, ninth or tenth grade, and hoping that they're going to apply to the Gov school, that's too late. We need to be inspiring those students at a much younger age. And I, that's why I think we need that human power. Um, the analytics of the testing is important, and it is helpful. But we need that human power, that person who can assess a student and what their needs are. And that's why I really appreciate her stories that she's talking about. Because, you know, it's interesting, and I really like the way you two tag team this, because you kind of talk data, and you talk story. You know, so I appreciated the fact that the data was not the driving factor of the story. It was how we reach the student. And, and that's, that's people power to me. So I apologize. Just all these just observations, I'm well, just... Well, thank you, Mr. Harvey. I think that kind of summarizes what many of your colleagues have been saying around the table. Any, any further comments? Well, I, I just um, am thankful uh, for the presentations tonight, uh, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Fowler Parks. And I wore my Hutchison face mask tonight because of my understanding of this significant early intervention. And I want to thank people like Dr. Brennan's wife and others who are just advocates for this across our community. And we have to start there. And I want to say that as I look around this table and, and look at each of you and those of you out there that I can see and all of the people who are watching via YouTube or later on on our Channel 17 and all of our staff, I believe that we have a team. I really do. And I, I feel your passion, Dr. Jordan that will address these matters and will literally do something about it in real time and space. And I say that because I've been in Lynchburg now since December of 1994. It's April and in December it'll be 27 years. And year after year, we see these numbers. And I know that when kids enter into pre-K and all of those first and second, third grades that Powell looks at, they come in with a book. But something happens, and that book is set aside for something else. Sometimes it's a bottle, sometimes it's a basketball. And all of those things have their place but I agree with Councilwoman Tweedy, we need to build back brilliantly and have real conversations, real, R-E-A-L as a team that will not ignore implicit bias, microaggressions, and other dynamics that must be addressed as we approach equity work to make this happen. Ms. Harvey, I like your idea about mentors. I think Dr. Larry Massey even talked about at one of his opening convocations the need for each student to have a person. We've talked and we've talked and we've talked. And Dr. Crystal Edwards, I'm so thankful that you are our superintendent at such a time as this. All right, if no one else has anything else to add, this would move us to our section E for informational items. 
The chair of our finance committee has advised that that meeting will be canceled for April the 27th. Therefore, our Tuesday, May the 4th, a uh, regular school board meeting will be before us and we will have all of that featured appropriately for you and in a timely manner. And I do want to encourage us to make sure that reports are in timely so that the board has enough time to review those reports <clears throat> that we can bring forth our best selves in every discussion. The legislative advocacy and community relations uh, uh, committee meeting. Uh, Chair Evans, did you state that that meeting is on still for May the 11th? You just let us know what those adjustments. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then our next school board work session is Tuesday, May the 18th. I do want to let the board know that between myself and the vice chair, we will be interacting with you uh, in the next few days so that we can determine venue. It's been brought to my attention that we may well need to find an alternate place to have our meetings after the May 18th work session. And of course, we will do that together as a team with all of us speaking to it and then making that determination. And so please be ready uh, to hear that. If there is nothing else that needs to be brought before us tonight that is of importance, meeting is adjourned.